This video is about breast implants or breast augmentation surgery. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet and actually a lot of confusing information on the internet about breast implants. For example, you can see 10 of us plastic surgeons in Alberta and I have to say all the plastic surgeons in Alberta are good, but we all think of things a little bit differently. The problem is that we actually don't have very good scientific information about the different choices. And whenever in anything in life, there's lots of different choices, it means that not one is particularly good and stands up above any of the others. I'm gonna give you my bias, which will be different from other plastic surgeons. It doesn't mean it's necessarily right or wrong, but this will be from my experience dealing with patients, breast implants, and different choices over the years. One of the problems with breast implant surgery is not everybody likes the same result. I show pictures to patients, for example, of a slightly saggy breast, and one patient will say that they really like that, and the next patient would say that they really dislike that, that they really don't want to look that way. So I've found in my practice that using photographs and now 3D imaging has given patients a bit of a better understanding of what they might look like afterwards. I can then understand what one individual wants versus another individual and I can tailor my advice, my recommendations for surgery to those likes and dislikes. Not everybody is the same. To start with, patients need to understand some basic different issues about the breast footprint, the shape of the breast, and the nipple position. For example, some patients are high-breasted, some patients are low-breasted. What I mean by that is that some patients have their breast attachment high on the chest wall, and some is low on the chest wall. And what a lot of patients are wanting me to do is actually move their breasts up higher. We can't actually do that. So if you think about it, with breast, pure breast implant surgery, I'm just actually putting the implant behind your existing nipple position. So in one patient where the nipple is low, or the whole breast mound is low, the result is going to be low. Whereas the next patient, if their nipple position or, or their breast footprint is high, the result will be high. Let's say one patient has a fairly high breast footprint but a low nipple position on that breast, well then maybe that patient, I might want to actually move the nipple up to a higher position by using a breast lift. So you can see that it's not all that straightforward. It can be quite different from one patient to the next patient. One of the problems over the last few years, I could blame on Victoria's Secret for coming out with the double push-up bra system. What they did was make patients think that their breasts should come right off the collarbones and that's actually not the way breasts look. There is chest and then breast. Sometimes this chest distance is quite long, sometimes it's quite short. The problem is that the double push-up bra has pushed breasts up toward the collarbone making people think that that's what they want me to be able to do. I can't. It's not normal. It looks weird. And after breast surgery, if you want that look, you can still use that double push-up bra system. But this is especially difficult problem for patients who are low-breasted who are hoping that I can actually achieve more than I can. Breast augmentation actually started in the 1960s. In both Canada and the U.S., in 1992, there was a moratorium put on all silicone breast implants because they thought they might cause disease. Now the real scientists, those that understand statistics and epidemiology, have since shown that there's actually no relationship between silicone and any kind of disease. And we'll give you lots of information, links to websites, whatever you might need to reassure you on that fact. But now, I no longer use the saline implants. I like the cohesive gummy bear breast implant. So in Canada, we were actually restricted to saline implants for about 10 years and the U.S. for almost 15 years. So a lot of the information you'll read on the internet actually pertains to the saline implants and not to the gummy bear cohesive silicone implants. The problem with saline implants is they're kind of like water beds. You can actually touch the breast and you can see these fluid waves happening. Lots more ripples and folds. And so really the disadvantages outweigh the advantages and the silicone gel Im breast implants, especially the true gummy bear breast implants, are much more natural feeling. They're not natural, so they do have problems. The problems with breast implants are mechanical, not health. 
All implants have ripples and folds. No implant can be expected to last for a lifetime. And the big issue is capsule contracture or where your cells form around an implant, tighten around it, and can make the implant or the breast feel hard and distorted. And I'm gonna go through each one of those. These are both cohesive gummy bear silicone gel breast implants. This one, as you can see, collapses more than this one. Although these are both gummy bear implants, and when I hold them this way even, you can see that the one in my right hand has more ripples and folds. But all implants have ripples and folds. In order to not have any rippling, you would actually have to have an implant that was either shaped like a baseball, which would kind of look weird, or be so firm that it felt un totally unnatural. So of these two implants, and I always use the gummy bear implant, this is the one that I like the best. Both made by the same company, actually. And in Canada, we have two companies that make and sell breast implants. We are not able to get some of the implants that they have used over in Europe and overseas. And actually, you know, that may be a good thing because we have really high standards and regulations. The quality of the implant does make a difference. To give you a sense of what I mean by gummy bear cohesive gel implants, the old implants that we had in the 1980s, the ones were made by Dow Corning, that's when people thought that they had health problems, but actually the problems were mechanical. They used implants that had a really sticky, gooey silicone gel, silicone oils in them. They had a, not a very good envelope. The oils would leak through the, in, um, the envelope of the implant and cause all sorts of problems. The implants we have now, they're not perfect, but they're definitely way better. So what I've done with this particular implant, I've actually cut it in two. And you can see that that silicone gel doesn't ooze out. You can squish it like this and it bounces right back. It really is like a gummy bear. So you can see that even if this implant formed a tear in it, it wouldn't ooze out, cause a mess like the old Dow Corning implants from the 1980s. So the first problem with implants are the ripples and folds. So we want enough padding over the implant so that you can't see or feel the ripples. Now that actually doesn't work completely and I'll talk in a minute about the up, above and below the muscle. Almost all implants you can feel some rippling, especially on the outer aspect of the breast where even under the muscle there's no muscle covering it. So you need to go into this thinking that your partner will be able, to, and you, will be able to feel some rippling. The more normal breast tissue you have, the more fat you have, the less likely you, you are to feel it. If you have a relatively small implant in a breast that has lots of padding, you may not be able to feel any ripples or folds or see any implant edges. But if you are thin, with very little breast tissue, and obviously those are the patients who really want breast implants, you have to realize that anything underneath your skin or breast might show. Somebody who's lost a lot of weight, the ribs show. If I put an implant under skin that doesn't have a lot of padding, you may see the edges, and that's when under the muscle might be a better choice for you. The second issue with implants is not lasting a lifetime. Now, the Dow Corning implants, and a lot of you may have heard about 10-year rule, that implants will only last about 10 years. That actually was only with the Dow Corning implants. We knew a lot of them had come apart by about 10 years. These new implants that we have now, we think that they're going to last at least 15 to 20 years. But that means you have to go into the surgery assuming that you're going to have to replace them at some point. Sometimes we use the word rupture as if the implants explodes. That's not what happens. What happens is, and I'm gonna show you with this implant, if you have a bit of a fold flaw, let's say the implant sits in you, in you with a bit of a fold in it, you might get what we call a fold flaw where the envelope splits. Think of using a plastic bag. You might use a plastic bag too many times and the actual bag splits. Well, with the cohesive gummy bear type of gel inside, you may not know that you have a split. You may not need to know you have a split because the gel just sits there and doesn't do anything. Now, whereas the old Dow Corning implant, this gel would leak out, it would cover the surface of the implant, irritate the capsule, it would cause capsular contracture and all sorts of problems. MRIs 
Mammograms are not particularly good at telling whether an implant ruptures. So we're always happy to see patients afterwards. For example, if you got a mammogram that suggested an implant might have ruptured, then come back and see us. We'll do an examination, try to figure out whether there's a problem, and then go over your different options for you. Some people it might be just wait and see. Other people who might not be able to sleep at night worrying, then the next choice would be to go back at surgery and check. The biggest problem with breast implants is capsular contracture. When you get a sliver, for example, your body forms a capsule around the sliver, tightens around it, and tries to push it out through the skin. And that's a good system for slivers, but we don't actually want it tightening too much around the implant, because as soon as the capsule, which is your cells, attached to your breast tissue, when it tightens around the implant, kind of wall it off like a sliver, we don't actually want it to keep tightening, because then it can make the implant tighten up, make it distorted in shape, and make it too firm. Why does it happen? Well, any foreign body gets a capsule around it, whether it's a pacemaker, breast implant, sliver, um, knee replacement, any of those things will form a capsule. What we don't want to have happen is a capsule tighten. Our problem is we can't predict who's going to get the capsular contracture, we can't prevent it, and we can't always treat it. There's no question, though, that the implants we have now are way better than the implants we had in the 80s. Capsular contracture now occurs in about 5% of patients in the first five years, with some increase over time. Whereas the Dow Corning implants, those implants that sort of the oil, silicone oils would leach through the envelope, the capsular contracture rate was much higher, 10, 20% even. So 5% in the first five years is not much unless you're in that 5%. So we can't predict it. Yes, a good quality implant makes a difference. And we're happy that in Canada there are good regulations so that we only have good quality implants. We can't predict it. It isn't size of the implants. It isn't texturing. And although you may read about above and below the muscle, that below the muscle is better, the science doesn't actually back that up. So we're not really sure what we can do to predict who's going to get capsular contracture. It has nothing to do with how your skin heals, the kind of scars you form color your hair or anything like that so we don't know we can't prevent it we do have patients take vitamin E but we're not really sure that that makes any difference then we can't always treat capsular contracture treating it you're back under anesthetic you're asleep we look at the the take out the implant look at the capsule decide whether the capsule needs to be released part of it removed all of it removed that same implant put back in, a new implant put back in, depends on what we find. But then that surgery only works in about 50% or half of the patients. So it can be really frustrating for those patients that get recurrent capsular contracture. What happens to your breasts if the implants are completely taken out? It doesn't happen very often. Patients often would rather a little bit of hardening than to have the implants removed. But for most patients, as long as you don't do the Pamela Lee Anderson thing, stretch your breasts out like a paper bag, you use a reasonable size implant, your breasts actually will bounce back pretty much to the way it was after you've had children. So what I mean by that, if you haven't had kids, you have implants, you decide to take them out, they have, might have a little bit of an empty look as if you've had babies. If you've had babies and have even had the implants taken out, they'll actually look much like they did before you had the surgery. With a scar, of course, with a 5% chance of potentially losing sensation in the nipples and the breast skin. Speaking about breastfeeding, breast implants do not affect breastfeeding at all. We don't touch the breast. We go in behind the breast or behind the breast and muscle. So I have a plastic surgeon friend who has studied breastfeeding and really it's not a mechanical problem that patients can't breastfeed, they're just petrified that breastfeeding is going to destroy the, the shape of the breast after implants. And it's actually the pregnancy that causes the problem, not the breastfeeding. So for patients who've had breast implants, if you want to breastfeed, it's a good idea, go right ahead. One of the big controversies amongst plastic surgeons, and you'll get a lot of us that completely disagree, above the muscle or below the muscle. Some plastic surgeons will only go above, some below. I think it's best to actually talk to you about the different choices. 
Some patients are better below the muscle. Some patients, I think, are actually better above the muscle. I personally believe you can get a more natural look above the muscle if you have enough padding, both breast and fatty tissue. But if you're super thin, have very little breast tissue, very little mus very little um, fatty tissue, then I think under the muscle might be the right choice. Why would you do one versus the other? The main reason is for padding. Mammograms are harder to do when it, breast implants are in place. It doesn't matter whether they're above or below the muscle these days. Mammograms, ultrasounds, it really doesn't make that much difference. But you do need to understand that mammograms can't see through implants and you actually have to go to a place for your mammogram where they're comfortable doing with implants. And they can see the breast tissue um, with ultrasounds as well they can still see normal breast tissue. A lot of my patients actually think that the implants between the skin and the breast, no, it's completely behind breast tissue or behind breast tissue and muscle. So you can still feel your breast normally above it, still examine your breast for lumps. What are the advantages of above and below the muscle? Well, the muscle comes down from your arm, the pectoralis muscle spreads out across your chest and it inserts into the side of your breastbone. So if it's under the muscle, it's going to stay outside the edges of the breastbone. What's that mean? That means that you're going to have a wider cleavage. So under the muscle has a wider cleavage. Above the muscle, we can narrow your cleavage a bit. Under the muscle, every time the muscle contracts, like if you're lifting weights, every time the muscle contracts, it moves the implant outwards. Sometimes outwards and upwards, sometimes outwards and downwards. But every time the muscle contracts, it, the implant moves outwards. So if you're lifting weights, you lift the weight, your implant moves out, you let go, it goes back. And so that's what we call it the dancing breast syndrome. So in the gym, for example, if you do have your implants under the muscle, you may want to wear a loose t-shirt if you're lifting weights rather than one of those cute little running tops. Some patients actually get very used to this dancing breast thing and learn very quickly how not to have that happen. But lifting weights, playing beach volleyball, some of those things you can't help but have the muscle cause that problem. Some people talk about completely under the muscle versus partially under the muscle. That's kind of not quite right because the muscle never covers the outer part of the breast. Completely under the muscle is whether we make a little incision in the muscle or not and release it a bit. Does that interfere with muscle function? Um, studies aren't that good, but it probably does interfere with muscle function a little bit. So again, back to the advantages and disadvantages. Advantages under the muscle is more padding. So they can look a little bit more natural without that speed bump look that sometimes that you get when you see pictures of Victoria Beckham, for example. Disadvantages, wider cleavage, muscle movement. What are the advantages of above the muscle? You can get a more natural cleavage. So if you actually put your breast, breast together, you don't get that hole down that, again, you can see with pictures of someone like Tori Spelling. So there, aren't, there isn't one right answer for everybody. So it's about going over with you what your preferences are as to whether above or the, below the muscle is better. Some people think that under the muscle holds the implants up, but actually, Rarely do they hold them up, temporarily after surgery, yes, but rarely long-term do they hold the implants up. Sometimes they actually push them down. And again, those are the things that we can go over with you at your individual consultation. There's lots of different choices in implants. Smooth, shaped, textured, round. And over the years, I've developed a definite preference for smooth, round implants. Why? The problem is the textured implants, the theories are good, but they've kind of backfired and even years later people have had like sudden swelling in their breasts to doubling in size overnight. So until they perfect the texturing of the implants, there's no real evidence that there's any advantage. So all I'm seeing right now is a disadvantage. That goes the same with the shaped implants. Although you might think a shaped implant's a good idea. Um, and obviously they're not going to work in patients who have lost the upper fullness of their breasts. They actually want more fullness in that area. Um, but a shaped implant, again, the theory might be good for some patients, but they have to stick. Because you don't want a shaped implant to rotate when you lie down, because then it would misshape your breasts. 
So the problem again is that textured surface has backfired because it hasn't worked well. So until they get a good, proper, true tissue ingrowth textured surface rather than just sticking, because what happens? It sticks like Velcro, but it can unstick like Velcro too, whether it's your partner being a bit rough, mammogram, and that's when you get these two rough surfaces that, together that can cause this fluid buildup. So at this stage, there really aren't a lot of advantages, even though the companies are pretty aggressive at marketing them. I stay, let's play it safe. Let's use the tried and true, round, smooth, but cohesive gummy bear breast implants. So those are the ones, the fir slightly firmer, fewer ripples, but still ripples, cohesive gummy bear implant. That's the one I like the best. One of the other things that patients often ask about or seem to assume that they want a high profile implant, that's actually not true always because what we really want to do is choose an implant base diameter that fits what we want for you. So for example, a high profile little implant is going to look like a little golf ball in there. Uh, a low profile large implant is going to do the Pamela Lee Anderson thing where you can hardly move your arms because they're, they're, the implants are out in your armpits. So we want to choose a base diameter that fits you. After that, then we can use profile to give you some flexibility in size. And actually, you know what, if you showed a hundred plastic surgeons, a hundred different pictures of high and low profiles, textured, non-textured, above and below the muscle, um, shaped, non-shaped, we would fail the test completely. So you can't tell, we can't tell when a patient has a high or low profile implant. So don't worry about that. I look at you, choose the right base diameter for you, and then use high profile if you want a larger implant and low profile if you want a smaller implant. Now, speaking of larger, one of the problems with going too large, gravity wins. So if you got, want a really large breast implant, first of all, we'll show you with the imaging and with the photographs, that may actually not give you a good shape, may not give you the shape that you have envisioned in your mind. The other thing with too large is that they can look like balloons. Not only that, they can stretch the skin out. So as I said earlier, it's like a paper bag and won't bounce back very well. So I will go over with you at the consultation, a range in size of what I think would be acceptable. My recommendation with our discussion is what I think would be a good size. The 3D imaging, of course, will help a lot to give you a sense of what size you'd like to be. But with the implants, don't worry about the high and low profile. With incisions, there are basically three different choices of incisions. Don't worry about the belly button incision. Um, it's not used very often, and in fact, you really can't shape the breast footprint, the breast mound very well from a distance away like that. Now, I used to use the armpit incision for the saline implants because you put the saline implant in through a small incision, put it in, fill it up once it's inside, but with the silicone gel implants, they come pre-filled. I can't get this, this is 300 cc's by the way, I can't get the 300 cc implant through a tiny incision. So one of the things that worked with the saline incision through the armpit, armpit was that you could put a narrow tunnel, fill up the implant and it couldn't slide back the tunnel. With a silicone gel implant, it can slide back the tunnel. Also the armpit has a lot of bacteria in it and we do know now that any kind of bacteria around an implant can raise the risk of capsular contracture or the tightening. That's also a problem with the incision around the areola or areola. Doesn't matter how you pronounce that. When you make that incision, we actually do cut through breast tissue a little bit. Breast ducts have bacteria in them. They have shown some pretty good scientific studies to show that capsular contracture is increased using that incision around the areola thing is that that incision can be the nicest scar, but if you're one of the people that doesn't get the good scar, it's pretty hard to hide if you're in a locker room full of other women, for example. So your partner's going to know you've had the surgery done, so hide the incision in the crease underneath where we don't touch the breast tissue. 
where we can make a large enough incision to put the implant in. Some people have too small areolas anyway. So that's the incision. My preference of incision is in the fold or crease underneath so that, for example, when you're in that locker room, there's a bit of an overhang of the breast and people can't tell you've had the surgery done. So we've been talking about pure breast augmentation surgery, but for some people, especially if the nipple position on your existing breast is hanging lower than where your underwire sits, for example, those are the patients where we're gonna have to talk about doing a breast lift. Then the incisions or the scars are more extensive because then the scars are around the areola and down like a lollipop. I don't actually use the full anchor scar. I just go around the areola, areola and down, but that does add extra scarring. The lift also has an increased risk, about 15% of patients who may permanently lose sensation in the nipples and the breast skin. For some patients, an implant alone will be appropriate. For other patients, we need to just do a breast lift. And for other patients, again, we need to do a lift with an implant. And for some patients, there's lots of different choices. So an implant with a breast lift needs to be considered in a lot of patients. You need to understand about the implants. And then I want you to go and listen to the video on mastopexy, which is a breast lift alone, and mastopexy with an implant. Recovery from breast augmentation surgery is actually not very difficult. A little harder under the muscle because when we cut the muscle, it's a little sorer. But for example, a lot of patients with breast implant surgery alone will go, even with the lift, will be back doing normal things in a few days. If it's under the muscle, you're gonna be taking a little bit more for pain medication. It's gonna take a little bit longer to get back to doing things. So under the muscle, it might take a week to get back to desk work. But under the muscle, sometimes the implant rides up a little bit and we don't want you exercising that muscle. So if your work is construction or heavy lifting to any significant deg degree, we may actually want you to take three or four weeks off. Um, but normally it's a week to two weeks for recovery back to normal activities and, and even some sporting activities.